day 845 this was of the Trump administration. And we have news tonight in the face-off between the White House and Congress. New York Times on the board with two big stories this evening. First, Donald Trump Jr. will testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee. And then the House Intel Committee is now investigating lawyers tied to the president for possible obstruction. The Times reports this agreement between Trump Jr. and the senators came after the president's son canceled interviews with the committee not once but twice. That earned him a subpoena from the Republican chairman, Richard Burr of North Carolina. They apparently want to talk to Don Jr. about Trump Tower Moscow, among other things. Times says the deal his lawyers cut with the committee calls for him to testify in mid-June with the questions limited to about a half dozen topics and the time limited to no longer than two to four hours. Big window there. The president continues to question why his son was subpoenaed in the first place. And this morning, for good measure, president questioned the motives behind it. My son spent, I guess, over 20 hours testifying about something that Mueller said was 100 percent OK. And now they want him to testify again. I don't know why. I have no idea why. But it seems very unfair to me. Over to the House of Representatives, where the Times reports the Intel Committee is looking into whether, quote, lawyers tied to President Trump and his family helped obstruct the panel's inquiry into Russian election interference by shaping false testimony. Times says this goes back to Michael Cohen's testimony in February, that the lawyers helped edit false testimony about Trump Tower Moscow that Cohen gave Congress back in 2017. On page five of your statement, you say, and I quote, you need to know that Mr. Trump's personal lawyers reviewed and edited my statement to Congress about the timing of the Moscow Tower negotiations. Who were those attorneys? Jay Sekulow from the White House? Yes. Jay Sekulow, I believe Abby Lowell as well. And back now to the president, who today praised his attorney general, William Barr, for opening an inquiry into how the Russia investigation started. No, I didn't ask him to do that. I didn't know it. I didn't know it. But I think it's a great thing that he did it. I am so proud of our attorney general that he is looking into it. Now, the attorney general has appointed this man. His name is John Durham. He's a veteran U.S. attorney from Connecticut. He's going to lead an investigation. He's a lawyer who has handled special tasks for Republican and Democratic administrations over the years. Notably, the New York Times says this will be a review for now and not a criminal inquiry. That means that that man, Durham, will not have the ability to subpoena documents or compel witness testimony. However, the AP reports Attorney General Barr will also be working with CIA Director Gina Haspel, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats, FBI Director Christopher Wray, as part of this investigation into the investigators. Ray's been in the news of late uh, because of the fact that Trump, uh, after appointing him, has now decided to go after him. Today, the president was asked if he still had confidence in his FBI director after Ray disagreed with Barr's assertion that the Trump campaign had been spied upon in 2016. Well, I didn't understand his answer because I thought the attorney general answered it perfectly. I thought it was a ridiculous answer. Russia's interference in our last presidential election came up, as you might imagine, during Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's trip to Russia, where today he met with Putin and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. I convened that there are things that Russia can do to demonstrate that these types of activities are a thing of the past. If the Russians were to engage in that in 2020, it would put our relationship in an even worse place than it has been. Putin was kind enough to invite everyone to his summer home in Sochi for today's meeting, where he made a point of complimenting special counsel Mueller while calling the end of the Mueller inquiry an opportunity. We also would like to um, rebuild fully-fledged relations, and I hope that right now the conducive environment is being built for that. Because, uh, the, however exotic the work of uh, Special Counsel Mueller was, um, I have to say that on the whole he had a very objective investigation and he confirmed that there are no traces 
whatsoever of, uh, of collusion between uh, Russia and the incumbent administration, which we said was absolutely fake. Don't think Robert Mueller's ever been called exotic prior to today. And then just today, we got confirmation the Russians were indeed able to hack into two Florida county voter databases prior to our 2016 presidential election. The Republican governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, said no election results were compromised. Oddly, the governor then went on to say he signed a non-disclosure agreement with the FBI. He's agreed not to reveal which counties were hacked, but he assures the American people that election officials were notified. What a Tuesday night. Let's bring in our lead-off panel, Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. We welcome to the broadcast tonight Kelly Magsiman, a veteran of the Pentagon, the State Department, and the NSC under Presidents 43 and 44, Bush and Obama. She's these days Vice President for National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress, and that's a lot. Philip Rucker, <laughs> Pulitzer Prize-winning White House Bureau Chief for The Washington Post, and Jeremy Bash, former Chief of Staff at CIA and Pentagon. Pentagon, also former chief counsel for the House Intelligence Committee. And Jeremy, it's in that former capacity that I'd like to begin with you. What do you make of these dual stories tonight? Uh, DJ TJ changing his mind and agreeing to this package of participation with the committee, but also the questions from your old committee about Trump's lawyering. I think there are two issues that the Senate committee wants to talk to Donald Trump Jr. about. First is Donald Trump Jr. previously told the Senate that he was only peripherally knowledgeable of the Moscow Trump Tower deal. I think we all know now that the family was integrally involved, that Donald Trump himself was briefed all the way up until the summer of 2016. And so that testimony appears to be false. And second, I think there's a critical question of whether or not Donald Trump Jr. told his father about the Trump Tower New York meeting when the Russian delegation came to talk about what the Russians would receive in exchange for helping in the 2016 election, Magnitsky Act sanctions relief, etc. As you recall, Michael Cohen told Congress that he believed Donald Trump Jr. did tell his father about that. And I think we should congratulate and thank Chairman Burr for sticking to his guns here and saying that if you lie to a congressional committee, we're going to drag you back here and ask you further questions about it. And if it goes into the point where we think there is perjurous testimony, they should have a referral to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. And Phil, that last point Jeremy just made is so important. What do you think is the major driver that changed Donald Trump Jr.'s mind to come in and talk? Do you think it was indeed the kind of quiet power and authority of Republican Chairman Burr of North Carolina? It appears to have been just that, uh, Brian, although there may be more to this story than we know at this hour. But this was a pretty dramatic reversal for Donald Trump Jr. And frankly, it surprised me because Trump Jr., through his allies, uh, communicated in no uncertain terms last week that he viewed uh, this attempt to bring him back this subpoena as a political hit job. He was not going to comply. You saw his father, the president, speaking again and again and again about how inappropriate he thought it was for the Senate committee to try to compel him, uh, the son, to return to answer more questions. And then all of a sudden this week, at the beginning of the week, we see uh, the committee reach a, an accord of sorts with Trump Jr. He agreed to come to the interview, but only importantly, only on his own terms. There's a short window of time, two to four hours. There's a limit to the scope of the questioning as well. He, they can only ask him questions about a half dozen issues, not 10 issues, not 12 issues, but a half dozen issues. And so while Trump Trump Jr. looks like he's been conciliatory and doing a good deed here by coming forward to do this interview. He's actually getting uh, the ground rules uh, set in his favor. So, Ambassador Mike McFall, um, Pompeo, Putin, and Lavrov walk into a dacha, and uh, I'll, I'll read you this from the Washington Post. The Kremlin has accused what it calls Washington's anti-Russian establishment of blocking Trump's efforts at closer ties. The Mueller investigation was the prime culprit in that narrative. Uh, Mike, where did you put today's meeting? Well, I think it's an attempt by the Trump administration to uh, forget about the past. 
It starts with the phone call that President uh, Trump uh, made to President Putin, and the Russians made clear in their readout that that was initiated by him. My guess, I don't know this, is that they probably said, well, you should send Secretary of State Pompeo here to talk about these details. That would be logically consistent with how these things happen. And now he shows up in Sochi. I applaud the Secretary of State for reading a tough statement when he was with Lavrov and saying what I think should be the policy of the United States. He said that on the record, things that President Trump has never said. But that's all a setup to now what I think is going to be a meeting between the two presidents on the sidelines of a G20 summit in Japan. And it's all like bygones, you know, forget about what happened in 2016, forget about annexation in Ukraine, forget about seizing two dozen Ukrainian sold, uh, sailors illegally. Let's move on and just restore relations. That was the verb that President Putin uh, used, at least <clears throat> at, uh, during the remarks that he had with Pompeo. And Kelly, to welcome you to the broadcast, I have a dramatic reading from The Atlantic, and it reads as follows. Trump might be motivated by something else his allies and administration officials suggest. They see Trump following a good cop, bad cop playbook that is meant to sustain a necessary dialogue. Leave it to Bolton, Pompeo, and others to deliver the harsh message, the argument goes. Trump, meanwhile, will see to it that relations at the top stay cordial. Kelly, do you believe it, or do you think, for example, on the Iran front, the president's secretly jonesing for a conflict? Listen, I think on, on the Russia front, I agree with Ambassador McFall. I think they're they're getting ready to set up a big meeting between the president and Vladimir Putin. I was most struck by the, the common language that Vladimir Putin used with President Trump about the Mueller report, um, using this, you know, phraseology, no collusion, uh, it's a hoax, this is all fake news. And so that was a concerning thing for me to hear as a national security professor, to have the president of Russia and the president of the United States sharing that kind of language. Um, I also think that there are advisors around the president who do share, uh, do have different objectives than him. And I think uh, John Bolton in particular uh, has a, an agenda in mind with respect to Iran uh, and has created a scenario where he's backing the president into a corner with very few options other than escalation. Kelly, on that front, what do you think the U.S. message should be to all the players in the Persian Gulf right now this week? I think it should be a message of, you know, we're not looking to, to start a fight here. We will defend our allies uh, if necessary, but that the United States is not here to provoke uh, Iran in any sort of conflict. I think the United States at this point, and the president in particular, has to dial back uh, where we're headed with Iran. I think ever since last year, when we pulled out of the Iran deal, uh, which is almost exactly one year ago uh, this week, uh, the, the administration has been taking a series of steps to actually escalate and put us on a path to escalation. And I think that's not what the American people want. I think the American people don't want to go to war with Iran on top of, you know, 20 years of wars in the Middle East and South Asia. So I think it's very important for the president to leave himself space here uh, and to distance himself from his, some of his advisors. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.